Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I've been seeing stars and comets because those are the LED effects that we're going to create today. By now, you know the drill. I code live in the editor as you watch and I explain what the heck is going on and why and I show you the results, bugs and all, live right here. If you're not a programmer, it can actually be an interesting introduction to finding out exactly what it is that we do all day and why since the effects are simple enough that anybody can follow along with the logic. If you're a new programmer, it's a great way to learn, particularly the Arduino and fast LED libraries. And even if you're a seasoned pro, tinkering with RGB LEDs can be an entertaining diversion that adds a much needed dose of old school, low level action to your probably too abstract daily grind. Because that blinking lights are always satisfying, whereas JavaScript is not. Stars is the simpler of the two, so we'll start there and then we'll turn the star into a shooting star or a comet or a meteor. Hey, it's art, so you can call it what you want, but I'll show you how it's done. Stars and comets coming right up. Let's get busy. The code and the implementation for the twinkle effect is reasonably straightforward. All we're going to do is randomly pick one quarter of the LEDs and light them up in a random color. We'll put a small delay in between each one and we'll reset once we've done a quarter of the LEDs and wipe the slate clean and start over. That's all we need to do and it will actually give us a rather convincing Christmassy effect. Let's have at it. The first thing I'll want to do is include the twinkle.h header file. Now there is no twinkle.h header file yet. We're about to write that. Let's do file new and we'll save it as twinkle.h. I'll put a header block at the beginning of it. So the first thing we want to do inside the twinkle file is to define a little array of colors that are suitable for RGB Christmas lights. Because we could just randomly pick colors and fully saturate them, Christmas lights don't come in that many colors. There's a standard set, red, green, blue, purple, yellow, or orange, I guess more likely. So let's make a little array of those colors. Next, we need our draw twinkle, which will replace the draw marquee or the fill rainbow function that we initially had. I'm going to include the fast LED header file from within this header file, even though I know it's already included in the main header file, just so that we don't get the IntelliSense warnings that these functions aren't defined. The fast LED clear function clears the color bits in memory, but doesn't actually push them out with actually cycling the square wave on the data line to actually do the work of clearing them yet. It's just going to clear the memory so that when we draw, we get a clean blank slate. When we're done drawing, then we'll actually push the bits out with fast LED show. This is the line of code that does the bulk of the work for this effect. It selects a random index into the LED array and assigns it a random color by picking a random index in the color array and assigning that to whatever color the LED is holding. This is a bit of a poorly behaved implementation. It's a fairly simple and easy to understand one, so we're going to do it first and then I'll give you a better one. But what this does is it's actually going to show the LEDs, wait 200 milliseconds, and move on to adding the next LED until it's done all 16, and then it's going to reset and return. But that's not the most well-behaved thing because even though delay does background work for other threads, it doesn't return control to the caller, so it can't do anything else unless it spins up other threads. I do have one typo here that's going to prevent this from compiling, and I have to correct that by changing this fixing the capitalization on GLEDs, and now it should compile. And it does, so we'll upload it and see what we get. Absolutely nothing. Say it again, yeah. Well, you know why. <laughs> Remember I commented out draw marquee because we're going to replace it. Let's actually call draw twinkle.
Okay, simple enough. Let's improve this a bit and then we can tweak it and make it a little more interesting. It actually looks better in person than it probably does down here because the dynamic range of the human eye is quite a bit wider than the camera that I'm using. So to me, they look fairly bright and intense in person, even if they're like not that much so in the video. So I don't like this implementation of draw twinkle, as I said, because it doesn't return until it has drawn all 16 LEDs. So let's change that by adding a pass count to keep track of how many LEDs we've drawn and just reset every 16 and just continually draw every time. It'll be actually quite a bit simpler, but maybe a little harder conceptually, but you be the judge. Let's take a look. We'll call this one draw twinkle old. And we'll create a new draw twinkle. As you likely recall, declaring the variable as static means its value will be preserved from one function call to the next. So we will know what the pass count was because we'll increment it each time and it will keep track of it for us. So we draw every time we're called and every 16th time we're called, we reset the strip. All right, then go confirm that main is still calling the one I intend. Yes, draw twinkle. Looks right, let's upload it, see what we get. Should be about the same. And indeed, it draws identically, but it's a much tidier implementation because it returns control to the caller every time. Let's tweak it a bit by drawing more LEDs. Let's, let's draw a number equal to the number of LEDs that there are. And let's take the delay out and see what we get. So I've changed the number of LEDs to be the same number that we draw. Now I clear the LEDs every time we've drawn 64 LEDs, a number equal to the number of LEDs. And you might wonder, well, why aren't they all drawn? Well, it's because some are overlapping, right? They are random each time, and that doesn't exclude ones already drawn. Now that we've done stars, it makes sense to do shooting stars as our next step. What we're gonna do is take a little block of pixels, maybe four or five wide, and move it back and forth the length of the strip. As we're doing that, we're going to color fade all of the other pixels on the strip randomly by a little bit each pass through. And that will give us a fading tail as we move this bright block of pixels along. Just like last time, our first step will be to include a header file that we then create to describe and define the effect. I forgot the draw code last time, so I'm going to put the draw in here now. That way, even if I forget, it won't compile. We'll create a new file. We'll put a header in it. There we go. There's our skeletal file. Now we just have to go through and implement it. So how am I going to draw it? All I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a block of five pixels. I'm going to move that block back and forth up and down the strip. I also want to color cycle the comet as it flies along just to make it a little more visually interesting. Let me define a few constants up at the top of the function here. What we're going to do is run through all the pixels. And if a random number generator says, randomly fade this pixel, this is the amount we're gonna fade this pixel by, and it's a fraction of 256, because everything in fast LED is generally byte-based numerator denominator math. And so out of 256, how many fractions are we gonna fade it by? 128, which is half. So this value will fade about half the color out when we add that step later on. Comet size is how many pixels wide the comet is. Delta hue is how far to step the hue in between each draw call. As anticipated, we step the hue by that amount each time we come through this function. We're also going to update the position of the comet 
by stepping it in whatever direction the i direction variable points. If it's negative one, that means it will decrement the position because we're going to add it to the position each time. If it's positive one, it will increment the position each time and move it to the right. Or, well, it depends on where your LEDs are going. It will move it positively on your LED strip. Of course, the problem is what happens when it hits the right-hand side or the left-hand side? It can't overflow. And that's the only messy part of this is the test for that case. Now our comet size is coded to 5 right now, and that means we're going to have to stop 5 pixels back of the end of the strip because wherever we're drawing from, we're going to draw 5 pixels. Similarly, when we get to the far left hand side of the strip, we're going to bounce and send the comet back the other way. If you're not familiar with what this does, it simply multiplies the I direction variable by negative 1 and puts it back into I direction. So it's going to toggle it from 1 to negative 1 to 1 to negative 1 to 1 to negative 1 and so on. Now let's draw the actual comet at its current position. Now if we ran this now, all it would do is zoom across the screen once and fill the screen. Because we're never erasing anything, remember? So what happens if we just erase every frame? Well, let's try that. So I've added a fast LED clear to the beginning of every frame so that only the comet itself gets drawn and everything else should be blank. Let's see what that gives us as a start. That is our shooting star so far. <clears throat> Interesting, but not all that pretty. What's going to make it more compelling? Well, the comet tail fade. That's what's going to make all the difference. If we just progressively fade at each frame, I believe that would really just give you sort of a gradient as it flew by. Eh, we got time. Let's try it. What this code is going to do is going to run through all the LEDs every pass and dim them. Well, now we have to take that erase code out because we don't want it to erase the entire frame. We're just going to fade them all one step each frame. The fast LED fade to black by function basically takes any color value you give it and fades it towards black or dims it by the amount you specify out of the 256. I think this will give us a flying gradient. We'll see what we actually get. Not sure why it's winking off like that. I'm going to pump my brightness up a bit here to make the effect a little more dimmable. There, now we're getting somewhere. It's a flying gradient, and I've got the brightness cranked up now to 255 on my end, and I'll try to fix it in post to make everything sort of somewhat visible. I'm not sure how the camera's going to handle this one, but it's kind of neat, but it's just kind of night ridery. We really want more of a comet tail effect, so let's add an element of randomness to the fades. This should fade about every second pixel, randomly. There, that's more satisfying. To be clear, the random function here is going to pick a value between 0 and 1, because it won't go up to 2. It'll just do a number below whatever you specify as the max. And if that 0 or 1 value is 1, so half the time, it's going to blank out the pixel by 50%. And that kind of gives it that sparkly effect in the tail because it doesn't always smooth fade them all now because it's done kind of lumpy. Lumpy fade. I want to make one other change at the end of this episode before we go. We're not really using the OLED display yet, but we are drawing it every frame. So let's put a conditional test in there to only draw it every so often, and that way we won't waste cycles drawing it like 500 times a second.
Okay, so what this is gonna do is keep track of the last time that we actually drew the OLED display. And if it hasn't been 250 milliseconds yet, just skip that step. If it's been 250 milliseconds or a quarter of a second or more, then we'll go and draw it. So that should mean we're doing it about four times a second. That should also make the comet significantly faster, so don't be surprised if it gets a little hectic. Let's upload it and see what we get. Yeah, a wee bit faster. <laughs> All right, let me turn this off for a moment while we go and add a delay back into the code somewhere appropriate so it's not quite this fast. But instead of a hard-coded delay in the main loop, now it can be entirely up to the effect how fast to be. I'm going to delay 40 milliseconds here, which means 25 frames a second. Because 25 times 40, 1,000. If I cut the delay in half, it should speed it up by a factor of about two. And actually double the frames per second as well. There we go, a double speed comet running at about 46 frames a second, 46 to 50, somewhere in there. And for our last change, let's try making the position a floating point variable so that we can be a little more precise about how far the comet moves each frame rather than one pixel each time. Because that's going to have the speed of the comet, that's also going to make the tail that much shorter. So I'm going to change the fade out on the tail to make it fade more slowly. I can still use the one minus one variable, but I'm just going to use it as a multiplier of the comet speed now. So it will be half a pixel in either direction. As an array indexer, we can't use a floating point variable, so we need to cast that to an integer. Not bad, but I think I cut the fade out a little too much. So let me step the fade back up. And give it one last upload. I think the next improvement would be to trap multiple comets on the same strip and have them fly back and forth and overlap and color blend. That actually might look cool, so we'll do that in a future episode if we have time, because we're out of time for today. I hope you like the effects and the way I presented them. I'm not selling anything, and I don't have any Patreons. I'm really just in it for the subs and likes. So don't leave me hanging. Please be sure to leave me one of each before you go. Join me next time as we add a little dose of physics with a set of realistic colored bouncing balls. From there, it's on to flames and more. So if you're not already subscribed, this channel is so small, you'd certainly miss it. In fact, even if you are subscribed, you likely need to turn on the bell and personal notifications as well. That way, you'll actually get notified about new episodes. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time out here in Dave's Garage.